Okay, electrochemical determination of Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number. Now this is this is uh, it's pretty fortuitous that we should be doing this on this day of all days because it is today is National Mold Day. <laughs> It is October 23. It's October 23, and officially, so you're supposed to have some kind of celebration at like 6.02, either 6.02 this morning or in the evening. Have some, have some guacamole or something like that. Or, uh, yeah. So happy mole day. And uh, this is actually kind of an interesting experiment, so I think it will be a happy mold day tomorrow. Not so much when we're doing the calculations, but uh, for now, for now, it will be happy. Now, there are other ways of figuring out Avogadro's number. This is, this is one of a number of ways that, that people have used. And this, our technique is going to use an electrolytic cell. All right, now let me just give you some background on, yes, go ahead. <laughs> well, I would suggest maybe you could write on this sheet. Um, what I'm going to be doing is clarifying some of the stuff on here and expanding on it. So you could write right on that worksheet if you want or in your notes. I'm not going to just read the sheet, though, if that's what you're asking. So electrolytic cell is a type of, um, it's kind of like almost a backwards battery. Right? There are two types of electrolytic cell of uh, electrical cells. Electrochemical cells. Don't confuse these with the cells you learned about last year, obviously. Uh, there's no nuclei in these except the nuclei of the atoms that are in there. Two types of electric there's the first is called voltaic. Voltaic cells, and voltaic cells are actually just batteries. Now, let me give you a quick rundown of how a battery uh, works. So I'm just talking about a regular dry cell battery like this. It's called a dry cell because there's no liquid in there. There's a moist powder inside, but it's not like a liquid. And you can make batteries out of liquids like... Um, Battery that has liquid in it. Quick. Car battery, right. So a car battery is an example of a wet cell, right, rather than a dry cell. But batteries can be dry or wet. This one's dry. And here's, here's the deal. You basically have a, a zinc can. So the can, basically inside of here, if you were to tear this thing open, you find this. There was a metal can, basically, on this. And that's made of zinc, okay? And then there's a piece of paper or something like that, almost like a piece of filter paper, that basically keeps the stuff inside from touching the can directly. Then there is a carbon rod sticking down into this, which is joined to the negative pole of the battery. The negative? Let me check that. Hang on. I don't recall. Anyway, if that's the negative pole. And then this can, sorry, the can is connected to the other side. No, I got it backwards. Good. Glad I realized it. Okay. So you see what's happening here? Now, of course, I've just got a carbon rod hanging in midair there. It's graphite. Graphite conducts electricity really well. So it's actually a piece of graphite that's sticking down in there. 
And the other thing about graphite is it conducts electricity really well, but it does not react with anything. It's, it's inert, basically. It's very tough stuff, very corrosion resistant. So you got that thing sticking down in there. And then what's in the rest of this? Well, this is going to be a moist paste of an ionic compound. Now, I'm going to guess that it's something like this, all right? And so it's a paste of MnO2. Now, here's what the Mn is, though. This is manganese 4 plus. Now, these compounds could differ. And uh, in, this, in these batteries, I'm not sure that it's manganese dioxide. It could have something else in it. But it could work with manganese dioxide, uh, although you'd have to have some other things mixed in there, too. All right? Now, here's the thing. I've got manganese 4 plus and zinc. Now, we saw a reaction, something like this, before. When we did, when we put the steel wool in the copper sulfate, remember that? And it turned into copper powder, and we filtered it out. The reaction was something like this. You take a solid metal. In that case, it was iron. In this case, it's zinc. You react it with an ion. In that case, it was copper 2 plus. In this case, it's, cop it's manganese 4 plus. And this paste is actually moist, so this ion might be in state. Manganese dioxide is actually not very soluble, so I don't, I don't remember how they make this, this work exactly. But This then turns into, it, they just switch places. You end up with zinc ions, and you end up with manganese in some other oxidation state. Let's say, um, we'll just do this for simplicity. We'll say it goes all the way to the metal form. Now, what happened here, though, is there was an exchange. We're going to have to have two zinc ions because what happened is manganese took electrons away from the zinc. So look at this for a second here because this part is, is pretty important. You had neutral zinc atoms. You had manganese positive ions. That means each of these manganese atoms was missing four electrons. So what happened is the manganese ion took electrons from the zinc. So now the zinc is missing electrons, and the manganese atoms have the electrons back. So now the manganese atoms are neutral. Each manganese atom pulled four electrons to itself. It was positively charged because it was, it was short. It was short four electrons. Now it's neutral because it took four electrons to itself. Where did it take them from? It took them from the zinc metal, which now is positively charged as an ion. Now, the reason that batteries run out is because there's only so much zinc in this thing and only so much manganese or whatever the, the other compound is. Once they're used up, they're used up. Now, car batteries run out too, except that you can recharge them. So what car batteries do is they use a chemical reaction that can be reversed when you put energy into it. You can't do that with these. You can't recharge them. It's just the, the nature of the reaction that's, that, that's built into these. Rechargeable batteries don't use the zinc can. They use other things, nickel-cadmium reactions, right? They enable you to go backwards. So anyway, here's the thing. So here's how a battery works. Look at this. This paper separates the two reactants. They can't touch each other directly. We put the steel wool right into contact with the copper ions. So what we had was not a battery. The reason this is a battery is because the only way electrons can get from the zinc to the manganese, from the can to the paste, is by if we hook them up with a wire like this. All right? If I put a wire across those two electrodes, that allows the electrons to go across from the can into the paste. Otherwise, they can't move. They're separated. Now, ions, some ions can pass through this paper, and that's how we complete the circuit. All right, But the manganese can't. That's the basic idea of how it works. All right. So that's a voltaic cell. Basically, what you're doing is you're, you're separating the two halves of the reaction, two reactants, and you make them interact only through a wire. They have to exchange electrons through a wire. So when I hook this up, if I, if I plug this into a, a lantern, this is a lantern battery, 
I plug this into a lantern, the electrons are going to come out of here, the negative pole, they're going to go up through the light bulb. As they pass through the very thin wire of the light bulb, they're going to make it get hot and light up, and then they're going to come back down in here until the reaction is totally completed on any day. <coughs> now that's called the voltaic cell. They actually produce voltaic cells. Uh, they produce energy. Electrical energy. They produce electrons. So uh, this is what most of us are, are familiar with, this type of battery. Uh, the other type of battery is called an electrolytic cell. And that's what we're going to be using. These are kind of like backwards batteries. You can make a reaction happen by putting electric electricity into it. So input of electricity makes the reaction happen. Now examples are electrolysis of water. You put electri electricity through uh, water and you get hydrogen and oxygen. You can actually split the water. So we call this electrolysis of water. Electroplating. So you want to plate something with gold or silver or chrome. You take a baser metal like iron and you want to plate it with something nice. Um, that's going to use this process generally. Elec not electroplation, electroplating. Quite a bit of electroplating industry in this part of the country, Hartford area, Southbridge. There's some uh, companies that do electroplating. And then what we're going to do today. So you can use it to determine Avogadro's number. Yay. All right. Now, here's the actual cell that we're going to use. And uh, I know it's kind of a really cryptic sort of drawing on that handout. So this is supposed to be a beaker. with sulfuric acid in it at about 0 0.5 molar. Now that's telling me 0 0.5 capital M. That tells me the moles per liter. There's a half a mole of sulfuric acid in every liter of that solution. H2SO4. Now what we're going to have, instead of having like a zinc can in this case or plates of lead like there would be in your car battery, by the way, if we put plates of lead in this, we could we would have a voltaic cell. Because that's basically what a car battery is. We're not going to put plates of lead in. Instead, we're going to put copper wires. So we're going to put two copper wires in here. Like that. Sorry, yes, <laughs> SO4. All right, I have to wear Mr. T's goggles. All right. So these are the copper wires. And this is my acid. What you're probably going to have to adjust the lengths of these wires during the course of this experiment. The other thing you want to do is mark the wires by like twisting them in a different way. So like I might have them different kind of crooks in the end because uh, you want to be.
idea identified. So those are my two copper wires. When I when I put those in there, nothing happens. Okay? That's because this is an electrolytic cell. Right? If this was a voltaic cell, not, something might happen when I hook these wires up. But in this case, even if I hook these up to each other, nothing's gonna happen. This and you should you should understand that. Why? Because look. Both of these are exactly the same. It's a copper wire and sulfuric acid. Why would anything happen when I hook them up together? They're both exactly the same. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put electrical energy into this. Now let's see. Now for one thing, I want to show you a little trick uh, to get these to stay in place. If you put the, the alligator clip right over the glass as well as the wire, it'll hold them more firmly. And you don't want the wires to touch each other. That will just short it out and nothing will happen. We don't want the top of that. <gasps> <laughs> so when I hook these up, now something starts happening. I've got bubbles coming off of one of the I've got bubbles coming off of one of the electrodes. Which So that's not it, though. We are going to, so I've got a battery over here. Okay, and we'll say this is negative and this is positive. And the negative side will be bubbling. The side that's attached to the negative pole on the battery will be bubbling. The positive side will be dissolving. Now, this is important. You might think that the bubbling means it's dissolving, but it's not. Okay? What's happening at the bubbling side is hydrogen ions from the solution are turning into hydrogen gas. That's all that's happening. So the wire is being unaffected. The wire is just a conductor. But on this other side, uh, it's actually being dissolved. So now this thing right here is an ammeter that I'm going to put into the circuit. So let's see. On this, I have the negative side going. I'm going to have this side go through this ammeter, which hooks up to this thing. This is called a LabQuest. It's basically a little computer, and it will detect what sensor you have plugged into it, and it'll start giving you readings. So you can hook all different types of sensors up to this thing. So read pH, temperature, all kinds of stuff. Right now it's reading amp. Now you see amperage, right? 0.6 something. over 0 0.6, then you're actually going to have to start over your life. Because at that point, you don't know what the amperage is. So the way to do that, there's a couple ways to do it. One is to change the length of the wires that are going into the water. So I could take this out, and I could either clip some off the end, or I could bend it in a different place. Because if I shift, if I change the amount of wire that's in there, it will change the amperage. The other thing is check your connection. Sometimes if you just make this like I just did, I just made this so it wasn't so, so not so much of the clip was, was connecting with the metal inside. See how I clipped the sides and I just put that in the end. Okay. Don't unscrew these because they're so weak that sometimes it breaks the wires on the side. So just make sure you clip them. Right? This electrolytic cell. So now this is a backwards battery. We're using a battery to drive this reaction. And it's actually causing the copper to be dissolved. All right, now, 
See, this is reading amps. This is an ammeter. And the reaction that goes on here is copper atoms from this side become copper 2 plus ions. And on this side, hydrogen ions become hydrogen gas. And I wrote the reaction down uh, in two halves on the paper there. And what happens is every time a copper ion pops off, two electrons go up this way, and two electrons come down this way. It's quantitative. It has to be that way. For every single atom that comes off, two electrons go through. All right? And that is one of the key points of this technique. For every atom that comes off the copper wire, and by the way, over time, you'll actually see it dissolve. Like when you pull it off of there, you'll see that it looks shiny and thinner. So this copper wire will actually get thinner. The copper is coming off of it. For every copper atom that came off, two electrons were lost because it became an ion. It was copper zero, now it's copper two plus. It lost two electrons. And that's written on the back of this uh, front page. So turn this over. And what I have there in the top paragraph by measuring the current, blah, 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 that is a description of how you are going to do this calculation. All right? But first, we need a little bit of background information. Now, this is not on this sheet at all. Because I know most of you haven't had IPS, right? Who said IPS? It's a few of you. So, and most of you may never have learned about current and voltage, right? Because we need to know what current means in order to do this experiment. And I think it's good to just compare it with voltage, first of all. Uh, can anybody tell me what the difference is? Yeah, Ken? Okay, like the energy. All right. Anyone want to elaborate that? He said current is the electrons going through, voltage is like the energy. Very close. Yep. Well, the path, I guess I would call the path that they take the circuit. Yeah. Current is the amount of electrons flowing through per unit time. Amount of charge, actually, per unit time. OK? It's actually measured in coulombs per second. And that's equal to amps. OK? So in other words, when this says right here, when this says amps, that is the same thing as coulombs per second. They could just write. Instead of A, they could have written capital C over S, coulombs per second, right? So it's the amount of charge. And then voltage is the energy potential difference between the two poles. The potential electrical, sorry, the electrical potential energy Electrical potential energy difference between the poles. All right. Now, um, let's make an analogy for this, okay? If I had a, a waterfall, right? So here's here's a waterfall. The current would be the amount of water that's falling down the falls, okay? Current is amount, say, say oh, you know what I'll do is say like gallons per minute or something like that coming over the falls. That would be the current. The voltage would be like this. It would be.
because in the case of a waterfall, the potential energy difference is gravitational potential energy. It would actually be MGH, which is mass times acceleration due to gravity times the height. Another analogy, if you don't like that one, is uh, a hose. So here's the faucet. Okay, and then there's a hose coming off of this. And at the end of the hose, the water's coming out. Right, so here again, the current would be how much water, you know, current I might say in gallons per minute. And now in this case, the voltage is like the pressure. Now, you don't want to say it is the pressure, but it's like the pressure. Higher voltage makes more force pushing through it, right? And voltage is measured in volts. Now, both voltage and amperage are important. This battery has enough amperage to kill me, all right? This will put out enough amps to stop my heart. It doesn't take much. It's less than an amp, a lot less than an amp actually stop your heart but I can touch these two and I I can touch these two and I don't have to worry about it okay because the reason is six volts is not near enough to push that amperage through my heart six volts is not enough now if this was 120 volts like is in that light socket then I'd be dead if I touch this okay so voltage is what would push it through something. And amperage is the actual amount of current. Now, when you scuff your feet along the carpet in the wintertime, and then you touch somebody's ear or whatever, you're producing thousands of volts. Because to make a spark like that, look, this doesn't make a spark. It doesn't have enough voltage. It doesn't have enough voltage to actually push the electricity through the air. It needs a conductor. Its voltage is so low, this needs a conductor. But when you spark somebody or shock somebody, you're, you got like thousands of volts. Sometimes you can get a pretty good little arc on there. But the amperage is like probably microamps. So it's not going to hurt anything. Now, a lightning bolt on the other, on the other hand, you, know, you might have 500,000 volts or something. So it's plenty to push through a mile of air. And it's also plenty to fry you. Plenty of amperage to cook your insides. So when they dissect you, and then they see like this dark area that goes through the middle of your body. I actually know a guy who, I don't really know him, but um, he was struck by lightning. It was really weird. It was just, it was, there was a big storm a couple months ago, that a big storm system that moved through here. And he was out on his porch. He, was, he, lives, he works on a farm. He has a farm, dairy farm. And he was putting his boots on, and he saw a big flash of lightning and heard the crack. Right, and he instantly became worried about his kids or whatever who were out somewhere around the farm. So he jumped off of the porch. This was after he saw the flash. He jumped off the porch, and when he hit the wet driveway, it like struck him like through his legs, and it like blew out his knees. And he's uh, he still has to you know he's going through like uh, physical therapy and stuff to fix his knees. But it's just, you never know how that stuff is going to work. Um, but the idea, my, my point is that lightning has both, obviously. Plenty high voltage, plenty high amperage. So does that light socket, by the way. Plenty high voltage, plenty high amperage. Uh, so don't mess around with it. Now, even though I said this thing is not dangerous, don't test it, okay? So I don't want anybody doing like this sort of thing. Gee, I wonder if, you know, just don't play around with it, okay? Don't hook it up to your tongue or anything like that. I had a student who, this was in Chem A. This is when my first year was teaching Chem A. And I heard a commotion over on the side of the room. And I looked over there, and this kid was white as a ghost. 
and I went over, and laying on the counter in front of him was a pair of tweezers, and the ends of the tweezers were melted. And I just said, you tell me you did not do what I think you just did. And he had stuck them in the light socket. So there was like a flash of light. And uh, he was lucky that, um, he was lucky that there's, these are all ground fault interrupted. They're all protected circuits. So if they, if there's a, a big increase in amperage, they'll, they'll shut down. So. so did he get shot? Or did he die? I don't, he never said anything about exactly what happened. I know whatever it was, it scared him enough to oh, flush the color out of his face. So, so don't do that. Oh, hey, while I'm on funny stories about uh, your peers, we, we use these things in, uh, I used to use these in bio. We would do our own gel electrophoresis. And for gel electrophoresis, you need quite a high voltage because you got to get the ions to move through that gel. So we just hook these up in series like this. I don't know if you knew you could do this, but it's kind of cool. Because if you hook these up like this, this is now, this is now 27 volts. Right? And now it's 36 volts. Well, we were working with, uh, we were working with 45 volts. So that's what, in the lab, and this really isn't too bad. Um, by the way, if you are ever working with, with voltage or electricity, like if you're doing work on light sockets in your house or anything, it's a good idea to just work one hand at a time. That's a, a good way to be safe because if you touch these, with just one hand, and if it is high voltage, then the current might just go through your hand, right? Whereas if you're touching with both hands, well now what's it gonna do? It's gotta go through the trunk of your body. So what did this guy do, what do you think? Well, we had a whole box of these babies. Cause we were, we had enough of these for the whole class, so we're cleaning up at the end of class, and I was busy in the front of the room. And again, it was very similar. I heard, this time I heard a yelp. Like just kind of a yelp like a dog that's been hurt. And uh, I look back there, and this kid had all of them strung together. So this must have been like, you figure it's five times, what do we have, eight groups? There must have been 40 of them. So he was looking at like 360 volts. And he just strung them all together, and then he just touched the, oh my God. the ends. He got a shock. I don't know. He didn't. You know, they don't like to share about the experience in a case like that. Tell me how you feel. Tell me how that felt. Like the Princess Bride. Okay, so that is the background information. Now, how exactly are we going to calculate Avogadro's number? from this setup. How are we going to calculate Avogadro's? I'm glad that I can joke about those and that I've never had any serious injuries with electricity. And let's try to keep it that way. Um, by the way, car batteries, are car batteries dangerous? They can be dangerous, yeah. You can get a spark, you can get a good spark off of a car battery and they also have a lot of amps. They can produce a lot of amperage. Um, so you gotta be careful when you're working around uh, car batteries. So anyway, calculating Avogadro's number from this setup. Here's the idea, folks. You got one wire. There's one wire that's dissolving, okay? And the copper two plus atom comes off. This is going to be losing mass. All right, it's losing mass in grams. Now this wire, by the way, is called the anode. They are both called electrodes in this case, and this one is called the anode. Now the other one, the other one is kind of funny because we know that you're going to be getting a gas produced, and we don't really care about that gas that's being produced. It's just going up in the air. What you will notice, though, over time is, for one thing, the solution will turn blue. And that's because as the copper ions go down in there, you're basically making a copper sulfate solution. So solution will turn blue. And then sometimes later on, these copper ions will make their way over here, and they'll start to actually plate out on that other wire. So the other wire will turn dark brown as copper starts to 
return to its metallic state on that wire. But the key here is that this two electron thing, okay? Because by measuring the mass lost, I can easily figure out the mass of the copper that was lost. I just measure the wire before and after. Okay? If I could figure out how many atoms, because what is Avogadro's number? Avogadro's number is atoms per mole. All right? In the case of copper, it would be atoms per 63.546 grams. So I can get the mass piece of this very easily. I just weigh the wire before and after the experiment. But how do I get at the atoms piece? I can't count the atoms themselves. I can't see them coming off. What if I could count the electrons? If I could count the electrons, then I could just divide by two, and that would give me the number of atoms, right? Well, we can count them indirectly. So counting the electrons here's the deal amps so let's say uh, example 0 0.345 amps that is the same thing as saying 0.345 coulombs per second okay now let's say I run this experiment for 20 minutes. That would be 1,200 seconds. I could turn this into total coulombs. And by the way, this is outlined in that paragraph on the back of the front page, this procedure. I could multiply that by my 3, 4, 5 coulombs per second, and that would give me a total coulombs. In this case, 1,200 times 0.345, 414 coulombs. Now, here's the thing. What is Coulomb? Coulomb is a measure of charge. If you look on the back of that paper, it tells me this. It tells me how many Coulombs per second. I mean, how many Coulombs are one electron. So this is Coulombs. Coulombs per electron. There you go. Bam. Number of electrons. So, in other words, here's how it works. We know the charge on a we know the charge of an electron in coulombs. It's 1.602 something 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 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs per electron. We're going to know how many coulombs are going through our circuit at any given time. So we can figure out how many electrons. So we can figure out how many atoms are being lost from the wire. And then we've got the mass loss. Now we have atoms per gram. We could change it into atoms per mole. That's, in a nutshell, what we're doing. Okay, now the finer points. This thing is going to be fluctuating pretty wildly at times. So which, now, this is coulombs per second. That means this is a rate, right? This thing is basically measuring the rate of charge flowing through the system. We don't want the rate. We want the total number of atoms. So what you do is you take the rate and you multiply it by the time and you get the total, okay? The cumulative amount. So what I said to do on this worksheet is you measure the amperage from that red box every minute for 20 minutes. And then you're going to take the average amperage over the 20 minutes, multiply that by your total time. You can't just measure the amperage once because the amperage is not constant, okay? It fluctuates quite a bit. So instead, you're going to measure the, av the amperage every minute, 20 minutes, and average it. And that will be the amperage you use in your final calculation, the average. You're going to use the average. And you're going to have deviation too. We're going we're gonna to consider our uncertainty. We're going to use average deviation of the amperage, okay? Yes. I don't know. I guess just room if you have to restart and stuff like that. 
Um, you could do either. Like you could take an initial amperage reading, although you got to be careful because a lot of times it'll spike at the beginning and then it'll drop down and level out quickly. So you're going to kind of – one of the things – so now let's talk procedure. I already said we're measuring the amperage every minute for 20 minutes, okay? You're going to measure the mass of the wires before and after. I would suggest having both you and your partner mass the wires on the balances. We're using the analytical balances. They measure to four decimal places. Don't put anything on the balance pan except the wire. They can't handle a lot of mass because they're very sensitive. Have both you and your partner, because we're not replicating really. We just want to be sure that you've got the right mass. Because if you, may, if you weigh it wrong, then you're done. So you're weighing the wires before and after measuring the amperage every minute for 20 minutes. Got that? Now, finer points. This circuit will stop. It will stop reacting if I unhook any part of this circuit. So in terms of timing and stuff, by the way, you want to time pretty precisely. So if you have like a stopwatch app or something, you can do that. Just make sure you go, go. Right? Or just take this out. If you take one of these out, that will stop it as well. Make sure that whenever you stop time, you're stopping the reaction at the same time. Follow me? Those two things have to correspond. Wait, so are we stopping the, the reaction? Just reading? No, the no, you can just look at this. Just reading, it. just reading it, yep. Yes, just read it every minute. Um, oh, the other thing, when you're going to weigh these, you want to take this out. This will be back there in the field. This is acetone. You just squirt it off with the acetone. This will help it to dry really fast. And then you just do this for a minute or so. And it will dry out nice and fast. And then you can dry it. You can weigh it on the thing. Yeah? No, you can probably, um, you can just squirt it. Use, go in the field and just squirt it onto the counter. But it dries really fast anyway, so like it won't it won't last long if it, if it goes on. Oh okay. No. The other thing you are not allowed to do is to set it on fire, okay? Because it is flammable. So that's enough, I guess, of the details. Let me.